And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's webinar, Managing Complex Data Environments, sponsored by IDERA. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce you to our speaker for today, Lisa Waugh. Lisa is a Senior Product Manager at Adira Software for the Aqua Data Studio Database IDE tool. She has over 15 years of database industry experience, including speaking engagements and presentations on database tools and, and technologies, and enjoys defining the direction for database development solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Lisa to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, today we're going to be discussing managing complex data environments. Um, it's rare to have companies that use a single platform anywhere, so companies and IT teams must adapt. The days of different disciplines for different roles are gone, and multiple disciplines must work together. The lack of appropriate skill set can slow this process down. As teams are gathering for a DevOps and you're becoming part of a team, you have the different levels of skill sets included in that, and you also have different complex environments for uh, working with your data. So here's a typical example of a cloud infrastructure, and keep in mind, this is everything in the cloud. So this is pristine. So you have your application, your collaboration, or your financial manufacturer or distribution or whatever application you guys are using. You're having your database and your platform stored in the cloud. You're probably having your services managers and your infrastructure um, down and your networking being able to connect. And then you have the peripherals of your laptops, your desktops, and everybody connecting to the cloud. And this is a pristine of just a cloud environment. But what happens today in these complex environments is people are dealing with hybrid infrastructures. They're having their data center locally or could be in-house. They have their application layer could be on-premise or in the cloud. They have their database layer could be on-premise or in, in cloud. They could have legacy systems and now they're moving to the cloud. They have a data warehouse that's up in the cloud or they have their data warehouse that's stored locally. They're getting information from the internet and they might have a hosting region or not. And somehow they're getting into these webs um, via private. Now I could have made this screen pretty busy because that's the environment that people are dealing with today, but this kind of gives you an overall structure of uh, what a hybrid infrastructure example is. And when you're setting up your um, infrastructure or what the thoughts were setting up the infrastructure when you're dealing with databases and getting to the data is scalability and complexity. When you talk about SQL, SQL is structured query languages, but when you talk about relational databases and how they get in, these users, they had to scale a relational database on powerful servers. The data had to be distributed handling tables across different servers. And for the NoSQL, their scalability, it spreads your data onto multiple servers, and servers can be added or removed from the data layer at any time. The complexity was for SQL is that the design of the data needed to fit into tables and rows. And the database structure could be complex and, again, difficult to handle in large volumes if you're dealing with tons of data. Um, the NoSQL was automatically spread your data onto multiple servers, and it didn't require a defined structure. It could cache data in system memory, therefore making it faster to retrieve. But the key is you still have a structure and a SQL platform that you have to deal with the rules of that particular database and what you're dealing with. So the difference between the relational and the NoSQL platform is relational is like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server. They're based on a branch of algebraic set theory known as relational database, meaning you have relationships. You have primary keys and foreign keys and relationships on how you pull the data out. Meanwhile, the non-relational NoSQL like MongoDB um, collections are stored in JSON documents. You also have data warehouses that infer the tables and rows um, added on to that, and we're going to talk about all those as we get into those. You also have distributions that integrate in. So people that uh, have um, adopted the Apache Hive, which is a data warehousing project built on top of a bet, a bet, 
uh, excuse me, Apache Hadoop. Um, they provided a way of querying the data and providing analysis. And it gives like a SQL interface to get the data out and to these various databases and their file systems that integrate in with Hadoop. So I'm going to show you a, a, a schematic kind of a little bit of how it works. So you have Hila, a Hive, Impala, and Spark connectors with these distributions, and you're getting to Amazon, EMR, Apache, Cloudera, and Hortonworks. So pretty much you'll have your client for a way to get in to the particular services. You'll have your JDBC connections, your Spark connections, or your different distributions, your Impala Hive, depending on how you're getting in. You could have been getting in through ODBC. It depends on how you're tapping in. And then you have your servers that you're connecting to. You have some sort of driver that they're all connecting. And you're either trying to get to a meta store, depending on what type of a platform you're getting to, or the file systems of where it's stored in order to retrieve the data. So it gets pretty complex as you think of these hybrid environments and how you can get to these um, these uh, complex data sets. So I wanted to uh, give you access to or let, give you something that I read. It's Rules for Managing Hybrid Cloud Environments by Database Trends. It's a PDF file that you can download, and it talks about their eight business processes that they believe you should follow. I'm going to cover three of those in, in my talking points today. Ensure the flexibility of data movement. Embrace the range of tools. I'm going to cover one tool for Aqua Data Studio, which is called Aqua Data Studio, and prepare for new skill sets. As we talk about these teams that are involved, there's different variances of skill sets and how do you manage those particular skill sets. It used to be when you were dealing with databases or you were um, a part of these teams is that there was about nine personas I have enlisted here. You had an application developer, an application database administrator, a database developer, a database administrator. You have business analysts. There are four types of analysts, a business analyst, a data analyst, the data architect, and the data scientist who would do your algorithms. And those people pulled the data out and made sense of, of what you were looking at with the data. And then you had a data modeler who sometimes was in its own silo or would be on the DBA team. And they would create the databases and model them from scratch or tap into the database and reverse engineer. And then you have your people who are administering the database on how you get access to it. It could be you know, um, how you're tapping in if you're getting across a network. And then a lot of times you have your IT consultants that come in if you're working on big projects like your Aura Ops or, or some type of Salesforce or sometimes management, contact management system that you're getting in, you have your IT consultants with different various levels that come in. So I, I had also attached an interesting article I thought on DBAs are changing but not going away. I was talking to one of our customers who had a DBA title and he was telling me his title has now changed to a data analyst. Although he's doing the roles of the DBA, He's creating the objects. He's figuring out the space for the database. He's manipulating that. He's also working with a hosting service to manage that relationship now that they have an on-premise database and they have a database out in the cloud. So he's managing all that, but he's providing reports so that they can make business decisions. So since he's dealing with the data at different levels, they decided to make his title a data analyst. So as all these roles have um, certain key functionality that they need to contribute to the DevOps theory or they need to contribute to what your company is doing. They need to, um, they cross over in a lot of roles. So what Aqua Data Studio does is Aqua Data Studio is a universal IDE and visual analytics tool for um, dealing with data and databases. It supports over 30 data platforms and it works on all major operating systems. Um, the database platforms can be relational, NoSQL, or cloud databases, and it allows you to manage your data and access, import, and export, and visually analyze that data. So we're going to get into how Aqua Data Studio will help you manage these complex environments. So as you can see, we support over 30 database platforms where there's SQL, NoSQL, or cloud. We also support the um, distributions of Hive, Impala, and Spark connectors to be able to get into these different distributions and the complexity of that. And then we're going to talk about how we help you to query, query, and more queries because there's different kinds of queries. As you're dealing with these different database platforms, 
you have different disciplines for each database, and you also have different roles in how you're getting the data out and different roles for those databases. So we try to make that standard and uh, enable you to query the data and get your data out um, pretty easy. So like, for example, Google Big Tor Query has legacy SQL that they use, and then they have standard SQL. And legacy is a little bit different. It returns an approximate amount where the standard returns an exact amount. And that's just kind of a little example of the variances you can get. You can run a single query or multi-database instance query where you're querying two databases at once and how you go about doing that with the joins. And then you have scripts, which are multiple queries to be saved, scheduled. Scripts are just a set of rules that you use or a set of commands within a file, and you're pulling data back and forth, and you have those set of commands, whatever they could be. It could be insert, updating, or whatever, but we're going to get into the queries and what you can do. Um, the relational versus NoSQL platforms. Here's some SQL terms for structured query languages mostly how you pull the data out. And then for MongoDB, here's some concepts of the JSON documents and how you get it um, different. They're both databases. Um, one has tables and rows, and one has the collection. The row is considered a document JSON, a binary JSON document, and the columns are filled. The indexes are the same. Table joins they used to have in the relationship when um, MongoDB first came out, you didn't have the option of doing the lookup field, which is kind of um, allows you to do some table joins. You, weren't, you didn't have that capability. It was stored in memory, and it didn't work that way. You have primary keys on how you do it. So I attached a SQL to aggregate mapping for anybody who's on Mongo, but we're going to get into some different types of no, no uh, SQL. You know, we have uh, Snowflake, and we have some different ways of data warehousing and, and different options for you. So the languages of SQL, here's a couple examples of the differences of those as well. So you also have the people who are programming in the database, and they have to the language of the particular database platform that you're using. You have PL SQL, which is a proprietary procedural language used by Oracle. You have T-SQL, which is used by SQL Server, PLPG SQL, which is used by PostgreSQL. The reason why I pointed out these three is that I just wanted to show you that as we're creating these queries and how we help you with um, the particular um, syntax. So they're all pretty much doing the same thing, but they do it in different ways. If you look at the, the three examples that I give you, um, it's just the syntax. This is a little bit different, but you have to follow the syntax in order to run your queries for them to work when you're um, working on a particular platform. So if you guys are going to a new platform, let's say you're on Oracle or SQL Server, and you're going to go to Snowflake, or you're going to go to Postgres, and you want to know what's the syntax, how do I go about manipulating this, we're going to help you with doing that um, with Aquadata Studio. So what Aquadata Studio's primary features are, they allow you to register your server in your database, they provide a database navigation explorer tree. You build that when you register your servers. And then we have some query analyzer or SQL editors. So it's a SQL editor or a JSON editor, depending on what platform you're using. And then a query builder that we offer that allows you to build these queries quickly and to build these queries with the drag and drop interface. So if you're not familiar with writing queries, because you as we talked about, teams have different levels of complexity or different levels of learning. And so somebody who's not familiar with writing queries can use the Query Builder to help them do that. We have a table data, data editor for editing the data right on the fly. Once you get your results set, you can edit it. And then a visual analytics to tell your business story so you can do some some analytics on where you are and where you want to go. And then some tool sets for importing, exporting your data and DDDL, comparing the data that you have. You have schema and data and file comparison. And then we have an ER modeling tool that allows you to reverse engineer your database to get a graphical representation or to infer that representation if there are no relationships. So you can kind of see what you have. And then a database administration for being able to create objects and manipulate objects, see some statistics on some objects. If you have two developers locking each other out, there's a way for you to unlock those um, particular locks. So how do we get to all these servers, and how do we help the one interface? I showed you on the prior screen, prior couple screens, that we offer 30 database platforms. We also offer generic 
JDBC and generic ODBC for connecting in. And then you can make your Excel spreadsheets as a data source as well. And I'm going to show you how that's um, pretty, pretty easy to do. I do that all the time because I have a boss that works on his Excel spreadsheet over the weekend and he's updated the numbers and then he wants me to put those in the database and run particular reports on it. So there's ways that we can do, we can do that. Um, this particular connection file that we're building for connection to these databases is extremely powerful. And I'm going to go through how this really helps with the complexity of what you're trying to manage in these hybrid environments. So as you can see, I have Google BigQuery selected in the middle. And to the right, it's context sensitive with what I have selected over here. So it's going to, you know, what do you want to name your database and the type. I have a type of selection production test or um, my production test box here. And then you'll see that it will change the, the, um, the icons that I'll see as it's building my navigation tree. One thing that I think is extremely important people kind of gloss over is this tab color. I use this tab color to visually see when I'm using production. So if I make this tab color red, when I'm in the SQL editor and I do an insert, update, or delete statement, I can see that I'm on a production box. And do I really want to do that when I'm looking at it? I have my whole migration path set up. I usually have my development for blue. Test, it passes test, it's green, and production is red. That way I can clearly see graphically where I am when I'm in the SQL editor and I'm running scripts or I'm manipulating these scripts or I'm updating and doing things. So as I put in my authentication, this will change. If I'm on SQL Server, it'll change the authentication to reflect that. If I'm an Oracle or any one of these databases, the authentication will say. And then I put it on my information. I'm going to text my connection, and I'm going to save it. The minute that I click this Save, it adds this connection over here to the tree. It's going to add the Google BigQuery to the left-hand side. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to get to one of any of the main screens that I have within Aqua Data Studio, whether I'm creating a query, I'm helping to automate that query, or I'm building a new query, or I want to do something with those particular objects or database, and I want to um, build some analytics on it. So it's going to build this tree, and we're going to talk about the options that you have. When I'm creating this connection file, it saves this connection file in my user home directory the minute I click Save. But I have some options here. I have General, Filter, Advanced, Driver, Permission, Script, Fluid Shell, Connection Monitor. I'm going to go through these options because here's where the complexity comes in when you don't realize um, with using Aqua Data Studio and how you can manipulate. So when I'm setting up this particular database or this particular connection to the server, I can include um, the filter catalogs. I can say only connect to this particular, let's say I'm working on an Aura Apps application and it's stored on this database, but I only want to get to this particular schema or I only want to include what I'm doing there. I know that's going to load 56,000 objects, so I don't want to load everything that has to do. So I can include how I'm getting to the filter catalogs, and I can exclude what I don't want to see. So if I want it to be faster, I can use this way of connecting and manipulate that. Not only do I have the way I'm connecting in and what I want to see, I can also see the folders um, on how I want to use them as well, so I can control my folders. I also can specify if it's a data warehouse, whether I want read writes if I'm in the advanced, or what I want to display. Do I want to see all the system default layers? Do I want to apply the DB filters like I had? And how many connections are pulled, depending on memory and what I'm doing? What's my fetch size going to be? So I can control this down to the level I need to. I can also let the time of connection, how I showed you the screen with the distributions of how we're connecting into drivers. Well, we use the native drivers and we use the JDBC connection to get in. You can use the generic ones if you want, but you can also put parameters. I have one customer who connects into the client driver, but then they have added security where they're loading particular parameters on top of this if they want to get in. So right after the way you're connecting, you can load the parameters. And on upon this connect, particular connection, I can specify what I want to do with that.
I also have permissions. So let's say I have an analyst on my team. I'm a DBA and I'm actually going to roll out the deployment, but I don't want this person. I want them to see the data and be able to analyze and query the data, but I don't want to allow them to insert update these particular statements that are on that database. It's a production database and I don't want my analysts to be able to update it to that level unless they send it to test, we verify it, and it goes back. It just depends on the disciplines of your company on how you can control these um, complex data sets. You don't want that analyst updating, or you do. So maybe you would give them, yes, they can insert statements. This is automatically all turned on and you can turn these off and it gets very complex on what you can do with this particular connection. You can also run a script like I talked about at the beginning of a, a script. So if I want to query certain data, data information or let's say my boss did give me that, that template file and I want to update certain rows, rows that I created in the script based on his, um, the query that I'm running or based on the Excel spreadsheet, I can run a particular script upon this connection as well. I also, we have a command line driven for people who are really advanced. We have people who like to use a, a, a command driven tool. I can turn on the echo commands to see exactly what I'm doing as I'm running them, what went through and then provide me a log. Um, I can enter a shell script to be executed when opening it as well. Let's say I want to connect to certain servers and I run my, my TCP and I have a connection file that I use and I connect into those servers and there's some things I do at the time. So this can be pretty advanced as to how you're getting connected in to those database platforms um, based on what you're doing. I also have server properties over here where I can idle the time and I can say, okay, a maximum snooze time to be um, interval of whatever I'm doing or the idle time to commit after so many after I've been open. Let's say I'm going through a lot of hops to get to my server and I know it's going to take a long time to run this this particular um, script that I have, okay, don't kick me out at the time. Don't, don't uh, listen to what the security tells me. Let me have a little bit more time. So these connection files can be extremely advanced as to how you're using them, and you have different connection files for different servers. I could use that same connection and clone it, but I could add more connections for one person. Let's say I want um, one developer on my team to be connected to two schemas, but I have the other developer I only want to see one schema. And so I can share that connection file with him and I can include and exclude what I'm connecting to or what they're seeing. So it gets pretty advanced to what you can do. Now, the only thing we don't do on the connection file is we don't pass the password. So you always have to enter your password. But for deployment purposes, you can share those connection files. Um, I share our connection files all the time within our company and I'm connected, as you can see, to Mongo on the left, MySQL and all that. Okay, so there's three parts to Aqua Data Studio as you get pretty advanced. There's the servers, which I built my tree over here on the left. There's files, which are the files I have over here to the right. And then I have my working area here. We have projects as well and I'm going to get into how you use your projects to your advantage a little bit later. So what you have here is a particular way you're working, which is really nice. This is the way I work. But these are modals. You can create this desktop or you can create your environment however you want. You can drag and drop. They can be high or low or above. However you are used to working, you can build it. Um, also within Aqua Data Studio, you have op options for allowing different syntax changes. So let's say we're creating these scripts and our company has standardized to make sure that our comments have the slash, star, star, slash, and I want to infer, so as we're doing our code reviews, I know that everybody who's using this particular connection file, we're all on the same page as we save our scripts and we manipulate them. So you have that. You also have your quote identifiers or your statement separators, depending on how you work. I always use a semicolon for me because that's just what I'm familiar with when I'm writing my queries. So you can change these options based on the different um, syntax for that particular database, it does go and play with how you are connected, like I said, to the left. So I gave you two examples here. So for MySQL, to the right you can see I have auto completion turned on, I have auto commit, I have parameterized script, 
but for when I click on MongoDB, I also have the JS tree view available to me in the query analyzer and the MongoJS print JSON available as well, as well for Mongo. So every time you click on the options, it's context sensitive to what database platform. So you don't have to think about that. We help you with that. So how do we query the data? We have our tree over here to the left. We have our SQL editor or JSON editor, depending on what you're doing. As you can see, I have some color co coding up here. Like I said, I, I use um, green and blue and you know to represent my colors, red for production I have up here. So what I can do is I can type in information or the way Aqua Data Studio is when you build your servers list to here, you can right click in this menu and pass in the connection information so you don't have to collect every time. Or you can use the main screens. You can query, which is this window right here, or the SQL editor or JSON editor, depending on what you're using. And then I can automate. Let's say I'm not familiar or have those different disciplines on my team with doing an update statement. So I can say insert an update statement to the query because I have all these automation tools that are available to me and I put it in here. Format my scripts based on what I selected in my options to make sure that I have my, my comments a certain way and it's enforcing me to help. And I can see when I'm on the SQL editor what database. So as you can see I'm on green which is my test. That's the way I work. So I know that when I update this, I'm on test, it doesn't matter. The minute I click over to the tab, which is another connection to a server, it's on red, I know I'm going to update production. So it's very informative to what I can do from running that aspect. So when I query the database, this is how I ran a query. So I ran two um, select statements. I can select star from doctors or select star from invoices. I can have many selects. These are very simple um, ways of querying the data. And you can see I have multiple result sets down here at the bottom. I can double click on the multiple result sets and edit the table data right from within here if I set up my option to do that. And I can show what I'm doing inside of here. I can show an execution plan, which is the root. There's tabs down here. This is the grid view for the results, but I also have text view. I have an execution plan, which will help me decide if that's a good query or the way it ran. I get client statistics, and I'm going to show you what that looks like on the next screen um, when I get in here. But Anytime I'm on the tree view on the left-hand side and I click, it's context sensitive to where I am. So if I click on databases here, it'll ask me, what do you want to do with that database? Do you want to drop a database, create a database? If I'm on a table, it'll ask me, what do you want to do with this table? Create a table. Do you want to select the top 100? thousand rows, I can set the parameters to whatever I want. Do you want the SQL? It'll pass in the information and then load it in my SQL editor. So it becomes very powerful as to what I can do with what I have loaded on the left hand side um, based on what I'm connecting to. So I pull on the result set I called up the client statistics. So for this particular select star from job, I can see the statistics that I'm running. The number of insert statements, there are none. This is very basic statements. The rows affected by this select statement, 73 rows. You know, what I'm getting from this particular statement over here, the value and the average if I want to run. So how much time did it take? There's some pretty detailed things I can do with each one of these platforms that I'm connected into. So it can get pretty con. Um, pretty uh, advanced. I talked about how you query um, with the structured query language with the standard SQL. There's also ways for querying MongoDB with MongoJS um, for querying the database for doing for that specific, you know, um, JSON files. Um, when you query it, it takes on the way I set this up for this particular Mongo. So when I connect into my Mongo um, DB, it sees that it's a Mongo DB and it does the typical syntax. So you don't have to think of the syntax that is required, like I showed you for PL SQL. Same thing for SQL. You don't have to think about the syntax and what you need to do. We kind of guide you in that directory. If this was select star from table instead of orders in SQL, it would pop up the tables that are available to me. If I did DB orders and I press the period here, it would pop up the find and it would pop in what I have from within here in my collections. If I just did 
you know, select star. I can also change this to SQL contacts and do the SQL from the editors as well. So it gets pretty advanced. Let's say that I'm querying the data and I'm getting data out, um, but I'm not sure exactly what I did a week ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, I queried the data. The, my boss updated it. We ran the table that he wanted. What happened? So I can keep a SQL history and I can actually click on two of these history that it gives me the date that I ran, the server that I ran. As you can see, I did select statements from SQL Server. I ran an Excel file that I got from my boss. I did an Oracle on the Sybase. I'm using all of these manipulation, but I'm not exactly sure. So I want to compare these two Sybase versions. So I could highlight these and run right click and run the compare tool, or I could double click and load this particular SQL statement in and get the result set again and I can do multiple things with that result set. So the SQL history can store um, maximum numbers, you know, statements per 100, maximum history is 200. These intervals are set and you can archive them. They're just files that are kept off um, in your user home directory. So you can uh, control what you want to do from within here. Um, also, when you're running SQL statements and you're learning or you're pretty advanced and you don't want to do a lot of typing, not only do we guide you through the process of how to do the SQL um, for a particular platform because it's complex, we also allow you to have a multi-series mini. What we do is we have a query builder that will build these queries for you. And what it is is it's a, a graphical, um, you connect to your particular database, you um, right click and say I want to do the query analyzer um, in the uh, query builder, or you highlight a couple things, right click and load it in the query builder, or you can go to the main menu and select query builder from new. What it'll do is it'll see your connection, it'll pass in your connection. You can see I'm connected to two databases here. I have my client table and I dragged over my broker information and my client information. So all I had to do was select it and drag it over here. It automatically builds the SQL from within here to show me how to build that. And then I can run it and see what I get. I can apply where clauses. If I'm not familiar with writing them, I can say, okay, where broker ID is greater than 100. It infers the relationship if it's a relational data, data type, or if I select it on that connection for it to try and infer the relationships based on the naming conventions, I could do that. So I could do order buys or having it automatically. It's a fast way for for somebody who's applying this inside of your scripts or somebody who's new to the system of, of querying the data. You can also run um, same vendor query, meaning that I have two different connections here to two different servers and I can do an outer join or an inner join and I can try and, and see if I can make sense of the data that's somewhere else. You can't do one database platform to another database platform like SQL Server to Oracle. Um, that won't work because the disciplines are different for the databases. So what I could do for creating my scripts when, um, to help me with getting faster for these multiple environments is that I can select multiple tables at once and then I can say script object to Windows as create statements for these. Script them as to a template script if I wanted to script these files as one single file or allow them into multiple script files. And there's a lot of things I can do with this generating script for me. So it helps me to be a lot quicker with managing these scripts and, and doing them. I could also in further relationships, we have an entity relationship diagram. So let's say my company is on Oracle. I used as an example and they purchased Postgres and I'm not exactly sure how Postgres works, I could connect to that Postgres and I could reverse engineer that. This happens to be an Interbase one. Company has Interbase, I'm not familiar with the system, so I go, okay, connect to that Interbase and reverse engineer it. Then it'll give me a graphical representation of what those tables look like, um, what is included. I could do this for the metadata. Then I could start clicking and building relationships if I wanted to within here, associate them however I want. Or if I'm building a database from scratch and I want to do that, I can redo those. I can also um, build a database from scratch here and then create the scripts to manage them from within there. 
So one particular area that I didn't talk about and I wanted to um, get into is using the project tabs from within Aqua Data Studio. Not only do we have a way for you to create your queries and to, um, to create scripts, which scripts, like again, are multiple commands for querying data out or doing multiple commands. Sometimes you have a begin and an end and then you have embedded SQL statements. Well, Aqua Data Studio um, has Aqua scripts that we create. It's proprietary scripting language that we use um, from within Aqua Data Studio. We have a project tab, which is kind of a grouping like you would consider projects. You can put, you know, user files or connections, server connections in there. And then you have these scripting files that you can use from within there as well. So what they provide is a self-contained programming unit that allows you to create a set of scripts that work on a specific set of database or servers. Um, so you can manage multiple database servers and create these scripts all within a project, which is really nice. So one project is completed and it may be exported and shared with others. So if you want to be on the same project, you can do that. We deliver some canned Aqua scripts. So one, we give you the template for creating your own. If you're very familiar with Java, you'll probably understand this. Create an email and Excel files example I'm going to use here. Um, data schema and data exporter, if you just want to pull subsets of data and run those off and schedule those. File transfer and remote command line execution, if you want to transfer files, you can do that. Multi-server script SQQ. This is really nice because I said you can create multi-scripts in individual files or consolidate them all in one, and then you can execute them on multiple servers at once. So we help you build that and do that. Random table and generation. I use this all the time. Let's say that you just received a, um, a connection to a database and you're not familiar with the database, but you are, but there's no data there yet, and you want to see if you gave the instructions to the DBA, or you want to see if you had enough space on there and what it could handle. What you could do is you could random table generate um, on that particular database, like 56,000 rows or whatever you want to have it select the tables for you, and then you have some data that you can play with until it's up and running and until you've actually moved data in there that you want to play with, or you can specify the naming conventions of that particular data, like start with AO or start with whatever you want. You can specify the naming conventions so that you know it's random table and data generation, what you've done. You also have a way of comparing schemas. Um, if you want, these are some of the tool sets that we're going to get into that we deliver. But what you do is you set up your connection. So this one I'm using SQL Server on the right-hand side. I'm selecting from DBO Doctors, and I'm going to create an email and Excel file to myself. Um, I gave the path to where it's going to build it. I'm going to select who it's to if I want to send this to my boss and copy me or whatever I specify who it's from. And then I text the Excel file and I email it um, and I'm going to create the Excel file and I'm going to do it. Now, there's a blog that I created out there using projects for multi-scripting uh, environments. You can read that blog if you want to get more details or we have tons of videos and resources out there for being able to do this. Um, so what appears in the query analyzer? Again, the query analyzer is our SQL editor. This is a template that's going to appear within there. It put in the, the server name that I selected, which was SQL Server. It selected the database that I specified, and it selected what I'm pulling. And now it's going to email the file to me, and it's going to set it up. What's more important is that I have a directory structure now of a project that I created. So I have these Aqua scripts, and I have projects that I can create from scratch. I don't have to use what we have here, but it created this Aqua script, create an email Excel file. This is the folder set created based on what I'm doing. It's automatically going to load the server, which was a SQL server version that I have here, and it's going to load the Aqua scripts that I have decided to run from within here. So I could have files in here um, as any one of the files. So if I've created scripts in the past and I just want to organize them, it's just a container on where I can load these files. I can put them in different directory structures and share that, that project. So there's three ways of working you can use within Aqua Data Studio. There's the servers tab, which was the tree view that we built. There's the files way of organizing your files, which could be Excel files, like I told you I'm going to talk about. And then the projects of keeping it in a contained spot or using it. 
um, from within here and you loading the Aqua script and how I do that. I can also integrate these in with source control. Here I'm configuring source control for version control. We offer CDS, SVN, Git, and Perforce, the top five um, to integrate in with. I can control the file system, check them in and check out, and enforce our developers to use that. Again, we, we said you can enforce the scripting if you have certain standards to have comments look a certain way, to have your parameters look a certain way. Um, you can do that as well. And then tools to help you manage all these environments. As these environments get more complex and more, um, as you have more platforms you're adding to these environments, you need some tools for doing this. You need some compare tools for running your schema compares. You need to compare your dev to test. Let's say I loaded the schema on um, test and then on uh, on my testing box for my production box and I forgot to create a table or something, I can run compares and it'll give me a difference between the two. I can also do file compares if I'm running comparing two scripts. I can either highlight those scripts from within the SQL editor window that I ran, run a compare from there, or I can select two files from the directory structure that I had used and copy and compare. I can also run SQL statements that I've loaded so I never have to leave in my results compare. So if I get the results, I can results compare um, on those particular scripts that I ran or those particular individual SQL statements. So if I'm not familiar with writing the SQL statements, it gave me a SQL statement. Um, when I use the query builder, I can compare that SQL statement to a basic one as I put in a where clause or as I'm getting more familiar. As I get more advanced, those compares, I know exactly what I'm looking for. Those scripts can be extremely long and I can load and compare those. Um, schema script generator is also used to be able to generate those schemas and being able to to have me compare those. And then import and export data. How many times do you import data in from variable sources? You import data from CSV files and from, you know, from Excel files, and you're always importing data. Somebody says, hey, I need this data loaded. Uh, you know, over here I made some changes. Please import this into the test box, and you're constantly doing that. So this is a quick way of doing the mapping and importing that in within your connections. So again, you have your projects, you have the, the projects you created here, some that I did, big query, create an email, test project when I was testing it. So I organized all my projects and these are the tool sets that help me manage it. Here's an example of synchronizing the schema. So I have my source and target here. It color coordinates the differences between the two. Let's say I did my source and target backwards and I needed to switch them. I could just click this arrow and it would change the direction of how I wanted to um, synchronize this particular schema with what I have. Again, you're synchronizing the schema with the same database platform. So now that you have all this data and you're manipulating it and you're doing things, how do you report on it? So what you want to do is you want to provide some analytics, right? You want to broaden your access to a wide variety of data sources. We're doing that with Aqua Data Studio. We're managing with one IDE, even though they have different disciplines, it looks and feels the same. We're simplifying our querying analysis for doing that. Our query builder looks the same. Our, our SQL editor looks the same. And we're going to analyze our results and updates that we got. Um, Aqua Data Studio provides a robust palette of graphs and charts for creating these visualizations now that we've tapped into the data, and it provides an environment for development, collaboration, and integration. We talked about the dip, big DevOps team, or if you don't have a team and you just need to communicate with a coworker, hey, I updated these files, um, or actually I, the data looks a little off to me, can I send you what I want? I had asked my a guy that works with us who has a degree in business intelligence and he's the biggest BI guy and I was asking him, what are the differences between business intelligence and visual analytics? I get asked this question all the time and this is what he gave me. He says that the business intelligence is your review mirror. What happened, when, who, and why, and how many? You take that data and you want to see what happened to it. You want to report your KPIs on it. You want to have dashboards, ad hoc query. You want to be able to see 
what you're doing, and the advanced analytics is what you want to predict for in the future. What will happen? This happened five years ago. What if I make this one change this year? What's it going to do for me? How do I get in to get my statistical and quantitative analysis from what I'm doing? They both are dealing with big data. They both are structured in some unstructured data. And the knowledge generation is manual or automatic. I think these cross over. And then the business users, I think these cross over too. You have business users who are the business BI intelligence guy, um, but now those are kind of some of the analytics. Those personas cross over. You have your data scientists, your business analysts, your IT and business users. These are the reports that you're going to provide to management on what we want to do with our particular um, analytical. So the business intelligence is reactive, and then you have the advanced analytics for futures is proactive. That was his definition. So how does Aquadata Studio and how do we manage these complex environments to provide this business analytics? How do we tell a story of what we want to do? Well, one, we queried the data and we got the results set, and now we want to deliver that result set or make sense of it. So we're going to run the results set, and based on how we query it, this is where I said I use an Excel file, but it could be any one of these data sources. You can do anything that you can query. Any one of these servers that you set up, as long as you can run a query to it, you can create analytics on it. So if I click on you know, this little icon, it's going to say new visual analytic workbook or add it to existing workbook. If I click on this, what happens is it pulls up the visual analytics. And like the Query Builder, it shows a graphical representation of the analytics and it divides them up based on the type of uh, data types that I have. So it'll say this is for dimension and measures and it'll load it differently. Then I can drag and drop and build these particular um, worksheets based on that. So what I've done is I created three work worksheets. Profit by product category, the example that I showed below here is from a bike shop. So I'm loading a bike shop, bike shop, I own a bike shop business, and I want to see what's selling the most. So there's over 50 visual, visualizations that you can use with Aquadata Studio, and you can click and change them right on the fly. It's pretty easy. It takes two minutes. I did this less than three minutes doing these visual analytics. So by looking at this, I can make sense. For this particular um, bike shop, I can see that my locks are selling the most over here by a graph chart, and I can drill down and get the data. I can also have a pie chart. So what I did was I just copied this and I loaded it into a pie chart. And then I highlighted the areas that I wanted to see, which was by profit by state. So I have profit by product category, profit by product state, and then I have weekly sales over time. So I can start thinking of where we want to go. So this is what we did before. Now if I make a change to one of these data points, then where do we want to go next year? What do we want to do? What is California doing that we need to implement um, and the other regions that we have here? Um, so or the other states that we have here. So what I can do is I can drill down in the data. Now as I create these particular worksheets, I add them to a dashboard and I can share this with my boss. I can hand this dashboard, not only am I getting in the dashboard, but I'm getting the data that's backing up each one of these uh, analytics that I have done so far and said, this is what we've done and here's the data to prove it. Now he can make a change to the data. They, you can have links and he can update this and say, hey, I made a change and this is how it reflects it. So you can do some pretty advanced analytics with what we have with Aqua Data Studio. So what did we cover today? In today's database environment, they're more complicated. You have the hybrid environments, you have some cloud environments, you have the NoSQL, you have the SQL, you have your data warehousing, and it's not just a simple tide of data store anymore. Um, so how are you managing the different platforms? Well, Aqua Data Studio will allow you to manage those platforms with one interface. So I can clearly set up those connection files and those servers different based on where I'm connecting. So my Oracle could be different than my SQL Server. I could have two Oracles pointing to the same schema, but have them different disciplines for those connection files. So DBA could be you know, getting everything from there, but my analyst could only see in a subset of data. I also can control 
how who's doing upside inserts and how I'm running those. And then I can manage where I'm running the queries from. So each one of those queries, I can load them. I could also create them into a project and manage the projects um, across those servers if I want. And then I have the Aqua scripts to allow me to advance that into building more advanced scripts for running offline or scheduling or what I want to do with that. Then I take all that data from all these multiple environments and I create a data story with it. I build analytics to what are we doing? What have we done with this, with this information? How are we able to collect as much data as we can from different resources? I can connect it from Excel, I can connect it to the different resources, I can gather data off the web, I can infer, you know, the regions and what we're doing just by connecting to what I'm doing. So Aqua Data Studio makes it easier to make these business decisions and to connect to um, these advanced and multiple environments with these complex environments now that we're getting into um, in the future and what we're dealing with today and how our personas are crossing over. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope that it helps. I'm going to open it up to questions. Lisa, thank you so much for this presentation. If you have any questions for Lisa, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A section and just to answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day. Uh, Thursday for this presentation with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session. And everybody's very tight, um, quiet right now, Lisa. No questions coming in yet. <laughs> Everyone's having a holiday lunch. <laughs> uh, so uh, just when you, will you um, offer Amazon RDS support? Oh, that's, that will be out in January. So we're at we're offering the Amazon RDS support for MariaDB, MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, and Postgres. And that will be in the next release, which will be GA in January. It's already past QA, so we're really excited about that. So, nice. I love it. So um, can this tool connect to uh, mainframe databases? Any data sources, if you can connect to ODBC or JDBC, if it's not a supported platform that we have, then um, you might not get everything that is associated with that particular, like the new, um, because we offer native connectivity, some of the objects not be, might not be available to you. But we have some people that are connecting to different data sources that we don't support, and they get in through ODBC or JDBC connections, and they're able to work from the tree and query them. Fabulous. Uh, again, everybody's very quiet. Oh, is there any um, to any connection to MS Data Catalog? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. We have the Microsoft. I'm not exactly sure the catalog. Like I said, if you can connect in via ODBC or if you can get in the JDBC drivers, then you can try and connect to them. But the database platforms that we have support um, are here. I'll show you that it's on the screen. There we go. These are the database platforms that we've supported and tested and run through a vigorous QA, but we do have people that are connecting to different, um, different data sources for sure. I love it. That's quite the variety. Um, any other questions we've got going on? Again, it's, uh, it's a nice holiday season. Everyone's very quiet. Everyone's full. All right. Uh, do you have any new features coming out um, for Snowflake? Yeah, we do. We have secure tunnel, secure tunnel support, and we have portable forwarding for Snowflake. Um, also, if you go to, I'm going to show you on the screen. Let's see. Uh, let's see. I'm going to take you to Aquafold. We have a list of resources out here. So if you go to um, Aquadata Studio and you go to resources, I like the way this is organized is that if you're looking for resources, you can sort by resource type. So if you want to see data sheets or you just want to watch a video because you're not exactly sure um, how something works, you can take a, a, you can take a, um, 
a tutorial and you could go through and do a video. Let's say I want to do a video on video database administration or database development. I can click on video and then I can do database development from within here and it'll sort to the right of what exactly I'm doing. If I just want to learn about visual analytics or like I said, I did database videos. There's one for Interbase, Snowflake, there's a Aqua Data Studio overview demonstration and it has everything that has to do with development. So if I'm a developer and I'm trying to figure out how I develop on the database, then I can watch one of these videos with Aqua Data Studio. It's really nice on being able to sort and being able to do stuff. So um, you can go out and take a trial of Aqua Data Studio. It's a 14-day trial, so if you go and download, then you have it for 14 days, and you can trial the functionality that we have. Except for import and export, that's not on the trial. That's, uh, that's the only thing that we do. I don't know. Nice. And is this tool available on different cloud environments, Azure, AWS, et cetera? Yes, all the cloud environments are listed on that sheet, but uh, you, there's a lot of cloud environments. There's Snowflake, Mongo, JS. There's a bunch of cloud environments that are supported um, uh, with that. You'll have the RDSs coming out. You have a bunch of cloud environments that are available um, with, with Aqua Data Studio, and you can see the list that's out here. And that looks again to be all the questions we have for today. Great. So, well, thank Lisa, you for having me. Oh. oh, thank you so much for the presentation, and uh, thanks to all of our attendees. And again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this presentation with links to the slides and the recording of the session. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.